first of all, let me say good. Let me say good morning. My name is Scott Bruin. I'm the director of manufacturing policy for Oregon Business and Industry, and we're just delighted that you are all here today. It is National Manufacturing Day, and that is what we're here to acknowledge and celebrate, among other things. Uh, we have a great program today and a great master of ceremonies, and so I'll introduce him right now. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you to our sponsors, however. We will say them all by name. There'll be a couple of opportunities throughout the webinar this morning. But one of those sponsors for not only today's Manufacturing Day, but the, the bus tour that we'll, we'll talk more about is the Greenbrier Companies. And proving that no good deed goes unpunished, uh, Jack Isselman, the Senior Vice President of External Affairs and Communication for the Greenbrier Companies, has agreed to be our, our MC this morning. So we're delighted to have Jack. I've known Jack since 19, or since, excuse me, since 2005, where he worked for the, uh, the State Economic and Community Development Department and was also an advisor to then Governor Ted Guangoski. He has been with Greenbrier for 12 years, and he is a great friend of OBI and Oregon business. So with that, it's all yours, Jack. Great, great. Well, thank you uh, very much, Scott. We have a panel of really excellent manufacturing leaders joining us today, so I want to um, not waste any time and, and I'll get straight to the introduction. So uh, joining us today is uh, Alicia Chapman. She is CEO of Willamette Technical Fabricators. We also have uh, Marv Nelson, who's the president of ADAC, and uh, ADEC is uh, such a tremendous uh, contributor to our state and particularly to uh, the community out in uh, Newburgh and Yamhill County. Uh, so we thank you for your participation. And then uh, one of our um, vendors is here on the call uh, uh, representing Schnitzer Steel is Con Tron. He is uh, government and public affairs manager at Schnitzer Steel. It's always uh, great to have uh, Schnitzer joining us. So, um, we're going to just uh, throw some questions out to uh, our assembled panel here and, uh, you know, look for some conversation and then there'll be an opportunity uh, for folks on the webinar uh, to join us uh, in asking uh, questions of the panel. So, hey, and Jack, if I could cut it. So uh, we've got the order just a little bit reversed. So we're going to go to the panel after we do the oh, uh, we video. Exactly. Right. We'll do the video and, and, and then, uh, some stuff before that, and we'll and we'll the, the last half of the meeting will be with the uh, right. with the panel. Sorry, I was uh, just yeah. jumping. There. We I am very excited <laughs> to get to this panel, but but we also have a great video to show you, and uh, and then Scott's going to talk more about the road show. I think with that, then we'll go. I just to get back. Yeah, <laughs> so we'll turn. I want to turn it over to uh, OBI's president Angela Wilhelms to sort of talk about. Uh, I'll let Angela introduce. For subject matter, but uh, but talking about the overall impact of, econ of of the manufacturing sector in Oregon. So over to you, Angela. Great, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jack. And good morning, everyone. Happy Manufacturing Day. Um, some of you may not know this, but OBI, in addition to being the statewide chamber of commerce, is also the state affiliate for the National Association of Manufacturers. And about twenty percent of our membership are manufacturing companies, and many of our other members are companies that support that industry, uh, whether it be in legal and financial services or uh, supplying other products. And so we're really proud of that role that we play here in Oregon and really proud to um, bring you some information today as uh, we help kick off across the country, Manufacturing Day and Manufacturing Week. Uh, because I know everybody is eager to get to the panelists, um, I will go through some information pretty quickly, but I wanted to just set the stage this morning by talking a little bit about the importance um, of manufacturing to Oregon's economy. And last fall, we released with the Oregon Business Council a report prepared by Echo Northwest on the condition of Oregon's manufacturing sector. And so we'll just walk through a couple of key points that I wanted to reiterate. This is available on our website, so I won't get into too much detail on any of these slides but just wanted again to ground our conversation. So with that, let's take a look at the overarching statistics around the economic impact of the sector. So manufacturing creates more than 214,000 jobs in Oregon, which is 8% of jobs. And it contributes 13% of Oregon's GDP. If you do the math between those, you can see that this means the manufacturing sector is highly productive. It contributes a greater relative share 
to GDP than jobs. And importantly about those jobs is that the median income is much higher than the average for all industries. You can see those figures on the bottom. So one of the things we'll get to in a minute is why it's so important to us and to the state that we think about how we can support and grow the manufacturing sector in Oregon. Okay, Katie, thank you. So one of the reasons Oregon is poised so well in the conversation right now nationally, as we talk more about domestic reshoring and supply chain management and increasing manufacturing um, nationally is this statistic here, which is that Oregon has seen growth in manufacturing of 14% over this time period, whereas the rest of the US has declined. So I won't comment on the steady decline across the country, but wanna emphasize here that Oregon is well positioned and outperforming many parts of the country. And we need to be thinking about how to leverage this inherent strength in our economy. And related to that is this statistic where you can see Oregon on the far right of the graph has increased manufacturing GDP um, just only behind our neighbors in Idaho and well ahead of the pace of the national average. So it just supports this um, information we saw a second ago. So not surprisingly, the, the manufacturing sectors and how those are divided um, has shifted over time. And you can see in this chart that really it's relatively evenly split between these five major categories. So you have um, on the far right, looking at the most current data from top to bottom, you have metals, transportation, and other advanced manufacturing, which is uh, represented on our panel today. So you'll hear more from that sector in particular. You have high tech and electronics manufacturing, food and beverage manufacturing, wood products manufacturing, and then everything else. But a relatively, evenly a relatively even distribution of those sectors. So this isn't just one piece of the manufacturing puzzle. Um, it's, the, it's the whole puzzle taken together that has really led to that growth in Oregon. And so looking at um, jobs, this chart shows the, manu the share of employment in each county that is manufacturing. And there's 30 counties listed here that had um, a statistically significant amount of their employment rooted in manufacturing. And you know, this is extraordinary. And so it shows again, the importance of manufacturing, not just to the statewide economy, but to individual county level economies and communities as well. And the last thing I'll just you know, frame the conversation in today and before we get into you know, what growth in manufacturing might do for the state, is I wanna point out a couple of things around the workforce characteristics. So again, this information um, and, and more of the information supporting this is available in the report. So I'm not gonna get into a lot of this in detail. There's, there's a number of charts that you can see here, but it's just showing the manufacturing sector which on the left are the yellow boxes compared to all other industries, which again, on the left are the gray boxes. And then on the right side, the chart shows um, educational attainment in manufacturing compared to other sectors. This slide here is one that I think is really important to reflect on, which this demonstrates the median earnings for full-time full-year employees in Oregon in manufacturing, which is the dark blue, and all other industries, which is more of that gray blue. And what this shows very clearly is that in manufacturing, median wages outperform at every educational attainment level, all other industries. So whether you're talking about graduate professional degree workers or workers who have not yet completed um, high school or gotten their high school um, equivalency, they're going to earn more in manufacturing than in other industries. And again, that goes back to what we saw in the beginning about that highly productive nature of the sector. Also looking at median earnings for full-time full-year manufacturing workers, we wanted to take a look at what um, manufacturing jobs look like from a salary perspective or wages perspective when we compare um, black indigenous and people of color in the employment sector versus uh, their white counterparts. And you can see here that 
for the middle two associates and bachelors, um, BIPOC employees actually see higher wages than uh, at those educational attainment levels of their white counterparts. That's not the same at the two ends of the, the chart. So there's work to do on those sides to even that out. But overall, um, you know, there are significant advancements in manufacturing in raising wages and um, closing those wage and attainment gaps for uh, our BIPOC employees, which is very important. The last thing I wanna do before I turn it back over to the, the rest of the crew is talk a little bit about um, what growth in manufacturing could mean for the state of Oregon. So we asked the question, what would happen if we increased manufacturing by 10%, which is actually a relatively modest jump. It's about four years of growth. So we're just talking about accelerating four years of growth. And you can see here some extraordinary numbers. Um, not only a significant increase in state GDP, but 65,610 new jobs. And importantly, a large percentage of those are outside of manufacturing. So this isn't just boosting one sector, the growth in this sector in turn boosts the entire economy. And you can see a nearly $5 billion increase in personal income for Oregonians. And when we look at how that translates into revenue to state and local jurisdictions, we can see nearly $800 million in annual additional revenue into those jurisdictions through taxes and fees. Um, that is extraordinary. And we did, you know, you can see, we just called out here the, the, the relative share that currently goes to K-12 that received that same relative share, that would be the equivalent of nearly 1500 teachers. So growth in this sector is not just about supporting and sustaining the companies and the jobs they provide, but it's actually about lifting up communities entirely and communities across the state of Oregon. So as we embarked on this journey to think about how we could grow manufacturing sector and what it would take and what policies were important, we decided to uh, take on a relatively um, aggressive, but incredibly fun innovation roadshow. And so the inaugural OBI Manufacturing and Innovation Roadshow was held this August in partnership with the Oregon Business Council and with the support of a number of wonderful sponsors. Scott will talk more about what the roadshow accomplished, but I wanted to give him and our team an, an incredible shout out for putting together uh, what ended up being more than 2,000 miles in 25 stops across the state of Oregon and a, a huge thank you to the, again, the sponsors and our site hosts. And so I'll let him um, share a little more about that. But first um, we wanna share with you this video that takes a look at the roadshow and um, what it helped us accomplish this summer in raising awareness about this important economic sector. This year, Oregon Business and Industry and the Oregon Business Council set out on a road trip across Oregon to visit some of the manufacturers that make up the beating heart of our state's economy. From high tech in Hillsboro to countertops in Klamath Falls and many stops in between. Nothing like this has ever happened in the state of Oregon where a bus has actually gone across the state, I mean all four corners of the state, to really bring those elected leaders into these manufacturing operations to kick the tires if you will. This was a, a, a tour with a really different focus and it was very enlightening for me. Throughout the state, manufacturers, large and small, contribute more than $33 billion to Oregon's GDP every year, providing equitable wages and a healthy tax base supporting schools and government services. So I like to think manufacturing is the silent giant in Oregon. Well, Oregon, interestingly enough, I think on a per capita basis is one of the largest manufacturers in the United States. Oregon's manufacturing sector right now, if we were to grow it just 10% from where it is today, that would create almost a billion dollars in new state revenue. Think of the wonderful things that, that you could do with a billion dollars. Nonprofits raise more money um, in their fundraising efforts. Um, schools uh, have more dollars. We have more tax dollars. I mean, manufacturing is incredibly healthy for an economy. Not only that, but the average job in manufacturing simply pays more than the average job outside of manufacturing. And that trend cuts across ethnicity, 
race, or levels of education. And that brings kind of an un, a hidden um, value to, um, to the economy, to just the overall health of our communities. Manufacturing in Oregon is a catalyst to draw people out of poverty, to increase prosperity, to improve people's well-being. But Oregon's most important economic sector is at a crossroads. As manufacturers recover from the supply chain and labor shortages caused by COVID-19, states across the country are improving their competitive position and working to attract new investment and innovative talent. We want Oregon to be a wonderful place in which to grow a business. And we have to realize that we have 49 other states that are competing against us to make that happen. It's been very disheartening to see the number of companies that have left Oregon in the last few years. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with some of our regulatory policies are not as attractive as they are in other states. Well, we heard about workforce challenges. We heard about land use and land availability challenges. We heard about tax and incentive challenges. And we also heard about just an overall business climate challenge and that these, these companies do so well, they provide so much good for so many Oregonians, and yet people, too, too many people unfortunately don't appreciate the good work that they're doing. There's still quite a few um, folks around the state, whether they're business owners or policy makers that may not even know um, that we're here and know what we do and the value that we bring the state of Oregon to jobs creation, to economic health and well-being. So the value for us always is to continue to keep that line of visibility open. The goal in part was to raise the visibility of manufacturing writ large in the state. And given the response and the number of people who participated, it was successful on every measure. Accompanied by leaders at every level of government, the tour provided a first-hand look at the benefits of a healthy innovation economy, as well as the opportunities and challenges we must be prepared to address. They appreciated that you had members of the city council, state legislature, from our congressional delegation. Uh, they appreciated attention being brought to their businesses and to also understand what it is they need for further success. I think that the more we can educate legislators, there are so many of them that don't really know anything about manufacturing or business. And we really want to help them better understand all of the good that manufacturing and the manufacturing jobs that go with it can bring to our, our economy and to our state. The healthcare system it takes all of us working together and coming to the table um, to resolve those, those big, big issues that they impact all of us. We all are, have common interests in creating an environment in our state that fosters, that encourages the operation, the creation, and the growth of manufacturers in Oregon. Okay, well, uh, there you have it. That's so I just just to give the audience a little perspective. That is the first of at least two videos that we will be doing. Um, that one was still even in the edit stage late last night. So um, you, you really talk about hot off the press. It's that video. Uh, so far, so good. We'll have to do a few more edits to that. Uh, but we really like the early uh, the early look of what we've seen. The other video that we do will be a little longer form. It will be designed to really get in more in the weeds of some of these manufacturing operations and really, and, and the intent with that is to use that for educational purposes, especially with elected leaders. But uh, let me give you, if, uh, Katie, if you'll bring up the deck and I will kind of walk you through a little bit of what this bus tour and the next steps entail. So, um, so thank you, Katie. Yeah, so as, as Angela mentioned, um, this was the first time in Oregon history that something like this has happened. I mean, there's been business bus tours, but never quite at the, the scale and, the, and the, the magnitude and the success, frankly, that we saw on this tour. We had a great team. I mean, not only the OBI internal team that worked to put this together, but the Oregon Business Council and Duncan and Andrew over there. Uh, Coastline PR, who helped us every step of the way, Chris and Lindsay over there. And then, of course, our sponsors and our tour hosts. It was fantastic. We covered over 2,000 miles, 25 stops, 
Importantly, we had over 50 elected leaders among all these stops to kind of uh, see these great operations. And with all of those 2,000 miles of 25 stops, we actually only had one setback that was one flat tire, but that gave us the great opportunity to pull into a great Oregon employer and, and manufacturer uh, who had, a, uh, who had a, a facility in Newport, Oregon. Uh, that would be Les Schwab Tires. So hats off to Les Schwab and thank you to them. Uh, next slide, Katie. Um, so with those 50 elected leaders, and not to mention local economic development folks, local chamber of commerce folks, just a whole bunch of, of, of very interested uh, parties, uh, we were able to show them the diverse cross-section of industries across this great state. We showed them that Oregon's manufacturers and, the, and the, those that support the manufacturing industry are absolutely leaders in innovation and in R&D and career path opportunities. Uh, Angela mentioned just the great jobs and the great pay and the great kind of step up that manufacturing provides. Also, and we learned that from an R&D perspective, even from a patent perspective, Oregon actually leads the nation on patents on a per populace basis and is right at the top on just a, a pure patent basis. So that's incredible. And those stories, uh, just a lot of people don't know. We also went into communities and we saw the great community support that these, these local innovators, these local manufacturers are able to support. One example, we were in Boardman and, and uh, we saw that you know everybody's having workforce challenges, everybody's having childcare challenges because of these workforce challenges. And we saw that in, in Boardman, working with the Port of, uh, with the Port of Morrow, Boardman Foods and about 40 other companies were able to pool their resources to create a, a, a cutting edge, top notch, uh, child care and education facilities. So that's talk about giving back to your community. Um, all of this are these great stories of Oregon manufacturers. And so a big part of this roadshow, of course, was to show these elected leaders, to show them these stories, to tell these stories, but also to take these stories and work them further on. So we'll, we've already had really good press response and a lot of good articles that have been written about this. And there's much more to come from that perspective. And then finally, um, what this roadshow did is afford us the opportunity to listen to the concerns of businesses. So on one hand, it's to celebrate these fantastic innovators, but of course, just as importantly, is to listen to the real concerns. And that leads us to the next slide, Katie, um, where, where we heard those concerns. And so, you know, what we heard on the road, well, we heard that innovators, manufacturers, these great companies that give back, love being in Oregon. There's just something special about Oregon and all of us that are here know that. However, <laughs> we heard time and time again, several significant challenges. It was mentioned in the video, but it bears repeating now. We heard time and time again, not a surprise because everybody's feeling about significant workforce challenges. And then what's driving those workforce challenges? And of course, childcare, especially in the rural parts of the state where they just don't have the facilities, they don't have the the teachers and the, and the child care workers, significant challenge there. We heard about land availability and the cost. There's just so many of these, um, these, these, these great innovators need more space to grow. I mean, if you're not growing, you're falling behind. And, and a part of that growth equation often includes land. And we've heard time and time again how difficult it is to negotiate kind of the, the land use challenges. And then even when land is available, it's so artificially expensive because of the artificial scarcity, that's a real challenge. We heard time and time again about the tax and regulatory uh, environment. We have a high tax state for businesses and manufacturers. We have a complex state for business and manufacturers. We also have a very complex regulatory environment for manufacturers. And it's and it's not only complex, but it, what we heard time and time again is it's inconsistent. Um, where, you know, one area is one thing, one area it's a different thing. And, and of course that's frustrating and costly for so many Oregon innovators. Uh, we heard from not uh, more, more than a few, I should say, that they are being actively courted by other states looking to pull in their investments, to pull in their, their, their expansions, to pull in their entire operations. And so that's concerning for those of us who want to you know, support and build Oregon. And then finally, and probably this is the um, kind of the sweeper of all, you know, all of these factors that are challenges work into the business climate in Oregon. Um, but but but. They're just policy challenges. All policy challenges can be fixed. We also heard, uh, again, in more than a few places, there's something bigger than that, and it's problematic, which is there's just not an appreciation for the good work and the good things that Oregon innovators do. Um, and that, and and like, and if that were fixed, even if we had these difficult policy things, we could almost work and live around them if we just knew that we were supported and appreciated 
and 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 folks wanted our success. And we heard time and time again that that's not how people are feeling about um, some things in the public sphere. So, uh, so let me put a pin in this uh, these issues because I want to circle back to this. Well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Katie. I just want to say thank you. Uh, we can't say thank you enough to the sponsors and the hosts of this wonderful you know, three week long, 2000 mile, never happened before, million moving part bus tour. Um, presenting sponsors were ADEC, thank you, Alaska Airlines, Greenbrier, Jack, thank you, Intel, the Tillamook Creamery, which was the great tour. We got cheese, it was it was old and good <laughs> as part of the, the test. Uh, thank you so much to our premier sponsor, Bank of America and Karen Vineyard, who was absolutely at a significant portion of our stops and was just an absolute, um, uh, a great person to have and a great corporate sponsor to have for that. Let's go on to the next one, Katie. And then our partner supporting and contributing sponsors. Our partner sponsors were HP in Corvallis. Thank you, Juno, a Georgia Pacific company, PNC Bank, Schnitzer, Springboard Group, Walmart, our supporting sponsors, one of the best wineries in the world, A to Z Wine Works, of course, Boeing, Cascade Poly Pipe, Duckwall Fruit, that was fantastic. Sierra Pacific Industries, and of course, uh, Warehouser, just love them. And then finally, our contributing sponsors, Boardman Foods, Food Northwest, uh, Pacific Seafood, which was a great tour, and uh, Roy Manufacturing. And Roy, Jim Fitzhenry, who was in that video, is the president and the CEO of, of Roy Manufacturing. Um, you can go ahead and turn off the... Uh, and turn off the, uh, yeah, thanks, Katie. So let me just real quickly, you know, we heard those stories on the road. We heard those challenges on the road. And something just to, to, to share with this group that OBI and others have been working on now for several months is a very proactive, pro-growth, pro-innovation legislative policy package for 2023. All of those elements from land use to tax and regulatory uh, situations to workforce, we're coming to the 2023 session with a very proactive, positive agenda to make change. This has never happened before in Oregon. I could not be more proud of this organization, OBI, as well as the other stakeholders that are involved. We often have to say no to the bad, to the anti-business or the, or the policies that would hurt business. And we're really good at saying no. And we'll, I'm, we'll have to say no quite a few times in 2023. But for the first time in, in, in decades, it may be perhaps forever, the business community holistic has coming forward with a very positive, robust agenda. So we will get as much of these things over the finish line as we can. Of course, that's greatly dependent on what happens on November 8th, but we're optimistic of whatever happens on November 8th that we have some leverage to do this. But even if only a fraction of these policy ideas were able to get done in the short term, and of course, we can look at them longer term. But again, if only a fraction, we still are a situation we are changing the conversation in Oregon. We are going to have a pro-business pro-innovation, pro-growth growth conversation. And others are going to have to talk to us about that, including electeds, including uh, Paul, including uh, agency heads, all those sorts of things. So we're really excited about that. Much more on that to come. All right. <laughs> Enough of me. I am, uh, I'm looking forward most, and the big best part of the day is the panel. And I want to hand it back to Jack to lead us through that. Thanks, Jack. Thanks very much, Scott. And uh... Your enthusiasm for this topic just uh, comes through the uh, screen. So uh, thanks so much for your leadership at OBI and, and all the staff and all of the support and, and energy OBI has brought to this. I mean, the the the, the facts are, are evident why, make it evident why manufacturing is so critical to the economy of our state and the, and the contributions that it makes. And um, you know, in my role here at Greenbrier, I, um, I often say there's no substitute uh, for when we're trying to explain why a policy matter is important to us than getting the people who are making that policy out on the shop floor. I've been on, I'm sure like everyone on this webinar, I've been on many uh, floor walks, both at our facility and at, at other facilities. They never end with somebody, you know, saying, well, I didn't really understand that or that, that didn't seem particularly important to me. I mean, I have always seen those factory tours and really with the participants who aren't in factories every day, uh, leaving in you know great respect for our workforce, admiration and appreciation for the work we do. So, get, so getting out there and doing it is great. Looked like the tour was wonderful. 
I, I, it looks like you ran into Bigfoot along the way, and uh, that was even before you got to the brewery in Bend or the winery in Newburgh. So uh, that's that's impressive. Um, but let me get into the um, Q and A with our panel here again uh, for folks who may have joined us uh, since the top of the hour. We have uh, Alicia Chapman from, uh, who's the CEO of Willamette Technical Fabricators uh, up here in uh, Portland, Oregon. We have Marv Nelson, president of ADEC over in Newburgh. And we have Khan Tron, uh, who is uh, government and public affairs manager at Schnitzer Steel, a company with uh, really centuries of legacy here in Oregon. And, um, you know, I'll kick off the questions uh, to you guys with, you know, my my the uh, kind of Greenbrier experience, everything that Scott had in that deck uh, and that was representative represented in that video is something we've experienced here. Um, and I'd say most recently we acquired our largest competitor uh, in 2019 who had two state-of-the-art rail car manufacturing facilities in Arkansas. And from the moment that acquisition was announced, you know, through all of COVID and, um, you know, even today, we are frequently hearing from the, the local, state, and even federal elected officials just checking in and seeing how we're doing. And, um, you know, I regret to report that does not happen here. Um, we, we, unless we do the outreach, we don't, we don't get called upon. And um, the corporate activities tax is one that has really made us look at where we do our manufacturing because we're essentially um, subtracting margin dollars. And when you're a publicly traded company, you don't have the luxury of doing that. Uh, every time we build a rail car in Oregon, as opposed to the other sites, uh, where we build because that is a gross receipts tax. So we pay it uh, whether we're making money on those rail car builds or not. And uh, it, is, it is a very, very corrosive tax policy. Um, and it is job killing tax policy in our experience. So uh, we've run into that. We have a, we have a very uh, tough regulatory regulatory regime for a manufacturer in the city of Portland um, that, that we contend with. And, and we're often investing a lot of man hours and time in scrapes with over minor, minor uh, events, you know, that in Arkansas, when we have similar events or even larger events, we're able to work out um, in, a, in more of a partnership type of way rather than a, uh, uh, you know, regulatory body versus regula regulated body type of way. So, you know, that that's a setup for saying, you know, and I'll, I'll call on each of you in, in order, but you know, what are you seeing in Oregon's regulatory climate, the policy environment, taxes, incentives that may be available that, you know, are impediments to your business or that may be helpful to your business? Um, and and I'll, I'll close with this because I don't want it to be, we love Oregon. I mean, we were founded here in 1981 by five people in a house over in Oregon City um, who had a dream to, you know, do this. And, you know, we've grown into a $3 billion company with worldwide operations. And, um, you know, we, our headquarters is still here. We, we want to grow here. Um, and we want policies and we want people who champion policies that make it so. So with that, um, Alicia, uh, let, let me throw it to you for kind of your thoughts and reflections coming out of, uh, of what we've seen and heard. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, so just a little overview. Our company, Willamette Technical Fabricators, is a structural metal manufacturing and machining company. We focus on transportation and clean energy infrastructure, so bridges, hydropower dams, wave and wind energy, plus other custom complex fabrication projects. Uh, how have we been affected by the challenges you described? I'm going to start with workforce because I'm really passionate about this and I've been working really closely with OBI to try to figure out ways that the Future Ready Oregon funds and other initiatives Focus on workforce development can help manufacturers like us who are desperate for skilled labor. We need support to train workers on the job with the advanced manufacturing skills that are going to make us more competitive and that those workers, frankly, aren't going to get anywhere else. Uh, we also need support for affordable housing, reliable transportation, the lack of available childcare, especially in Portland, uh, which are all major barriers for many potential employees, especially women and people of color. So I've been working really closely with some community based organizations to try to access a more diverse candidate pool. And I know how to find them, but I still got to fund them. Uh, and I applaud that there are programs out there that are supposed to address this need, but I'm still not clear. And I don't think I'm alone in understanding, you know, how do I, how do I get some of this money to help train my workforce? 
uh, which is a great segue for incentives. We've definitely benefited from the federal research and development tax credits, but we need to see something comparable at the state level uh, with inflation, rising freight costs, supply chain issues related to the war in Ukraine, like there's scarcity of nickel. I can't get nickel sourced out of Ukraine that I need to turn carbon steel into stainless. So we're getting really creative, uh, but there's an even more urgent need because of that to have tax incentives so manufacturers can keep innovating. Uh, what else? Land availability. That's a big challenge. My company has had to rent space in Vancouver, Washington because of the lack of viable industrial property in Oregon. And I'm really excited. I'm working with the Port of Portland to try to find a longer term solution for us so we can build a new facility. Uh, but once we get the land sorted, the regulatory climate is still a huge challenge for us. And a great example I have, um, I reached out pretty recently to OBI to try to figure out the right person at DEQ to talk to about getting a new permit so we could expand our manufacturing capabilities. And just background, we build huge steel structures for the US Army Corps of Engineers. They need to be coated in specialty paints. Without a specific permit to apply that kind of paint, I have to ship everything that I fabricate in Portland across the Columbia River to be painted in Vancouver, which is the same river. And then I pay BNO tax on the entire product, not just the paint. So that's millions more than the cost of the paint alone, not to mention the cost of shipping. So there's lots of obvious reasons that I'd like to be able to do all this in Oregon. But the answer I got was not who to talk to at DEQ. It was which lawyers to engage before I ever reached out to them. And long story short, that was really sound advice. Uh, and I'm going to keep doing what I was doing before in spite of the cost until things change. So I know that our partners in Washington don't hate salmon. They care about the river as much as we do. The problem is not the paint or the application process. It's these well-meaning but really prohibitively excessive regulations, which are a huge problem. Those are all those are all excellent points, Alicia. Um, you know, as a company that also uh, has to use volatile organic compounds in our activities, it can be really hard in Oregon yeah. to get permission just just to do that in a way that's responsible. Um, Absolutely. And you know, we've been doing it longer than a lot of the people who regulate us have been alive. So right. it can get a little frustrating. But anyway, let me um, let me throw it over to Marv and uh, for some of his thoughts on this. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. And Jack, thank you for being our, our moderator today. Uh, Alicia did a great job. Uh, just to give you a little background on ADEC, we are a family-owned business, uh, been in Oregon for 58 years, and we manufacture dental equipment solutions. And I think one of the things that, that's unique about ADEC is that we're a very vertical integrated manufacturer. So we insource a lot of the processes that other manufacturers typically may not uh, do themselves, which provides opportunities for people. And um, one of the things that's part of our model as well is we're very loyal to the, the state um, in terms of other companies that supply products and services to us. So in addition to creating opportunities for people at ADEC, uh, we create a lot of opportunities for other people uh, through the supply chain that we work with, uh, which where we can source in Oregon, we source in Oregon. And the family that owns the business is very committed to, to Oregon and gives back a lot to the community. Um, I echo a lot of what Alicia uh, said in terms of uh, challenges. Just to give an example, we, uh, similar to your Arkansas example, probably not the same scale, but we recently opened a new uh, training and showroom facility in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, at our grand opening, um, we were welcomed with open arms and uh, it was like we were a valued customer. And you just don't feel that in Oregon. And it always seems to be a battle. Um, and I think the one thing that would be helpful if our elected officials would at least understand what the impact of the laws that they're passing has to business. And a lot of the, the challenges that we've had are some of the labor laws. This overtime law that was passed a few years ago actually did not benefit the people, which I know that's what they intend to do, but it didn't. It was detrimental to our people because we had people that wanted to work more overtime. So if they would reach out and understand a little bit more through talking with businesses about what the impact of these laws will be, I think we'd all be better off. But I think the opportunities for Oregon are just phenomenal. Um, and I, I've always thought that there was a real opportunity for Oregon when you saw a lot of these companies fleeing California. But instead of being less 
regulatory and, and more open to business, um, we tend to copy whatever California is doing in terms of their regulations, which I think is a huge mistake. So uh, I think the opportunities are great. We just need more collaboration amongst the state and the businesses that are doing great work. And uh, Oregon will be set up for the future if we just do that. But um, it has been challenging. And it is challenging from a workforce standpoint because uh, housing is very expensive, as we all know. And it's just harder to make ends meet, even though we pay very good wages. We've had a lot of people that have left the state to move to other locations. They've, they've said, hey, I love ADEC but we just simply can't afford to live in Oregon anymore. So we're gonna to move to Oklahoma or Texas or some other state. So we've seen, seen a high incidence of that as well. Thanks, Marv. Yeah, the, um, you know, as some of those bills were going through on the overtime laws and on the predictive scheduling, I mean, what we, we tried to bring a manufacturing perspective to it. Um, you know, I know they were trying to address some situations that are experienced at retail and in restaurants, um, which, which, you know, may need to be addressed, but when you do this one size fits all approach, I mean, we ended up turning back to our workers who were accustomed to, uh, when we had a big build working weekends, working overtime saying, we, we can't even build that here because we can't deliver it on time because we, we got to limit your hours. And, um, you know, <laughs> when they said, why we said, call your legislator <laughs> yeah, same, and let them yeah. know. Um, similar but, experience. Yep. But that's a very, very frustrating position to be in when when you have workers who want to work and you have, and you want you want them to work and there's this uh, third uh, party intermediary there that, that doesn't allow it to happen. It's very it's very strange because it's not clear who benefits and, and I think it's the result of kind of a one size fits all approach that's not that doesn't work for manufacturers. You know, we are we're just different um, in in our processes and our workflow. And, and there needs to be some acknowledgement of that. So, totally so thanks, agree. thanks totally for that. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's, that's a great example. Uh, Khan, uh, tell us what's happening over at Schnitzer. Thanks, Jack. And thanks everybody for having me here. Um, I don't know how I got lost and found a way on a panel with two other, with two CEOs, but uh, always honored to be here. Um, so a little bit about Schnitzer. We're a large, vertically integrated metals, recycling and manufacturing company of over hundred locations across the U.S. We were founded here in Oregon, uh, still here in Portland. Uh, essentially, we collect, process, and recycle raw scrap metal and provide those recycled metals to mills and foundries across the world. And we also own and operate our own mill, Cascade Steel, in McMinnville, Oregon, um, that utilizes our recycled metal to make finished steel products. Uh, challenges for us, I, I think Marvin and Alicia you know, have said really succinctly, is just taxes, workforce, um, and the compounding policies and regulations of the state, right? Um, for workforce, you know, it, it we're, we're not, for whatever reason, whether it's cultural or educational, we're not seeing young members of the workforce um, viewing these manufacturing jobs as economically beneficial, right? And and fewer of them can still see the opportunities and growth in these in the industry and these manufacturing jobs. And then on top of that, you have uh, maybe if you're an educated professional in a certain field like law or engineering tech, you're still not looking at a deck and you know, rely on technical fabricators or sister steel, even though we all have accountants, lawyers, engineers, right? And, and you're, you're not looking at that as a, as a viable field. So I think that needs to change. Um, and you know, we all know about taxes, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk nauseam about that, but for, for us, I think what we, where we differ a bit with, um, with uh, Marvin Lisi's companies is for Schnitzer, we are a commodity business, right? So when you have state regulations and, and policies that also compound with local level regulations and policies, whether that's environmental, manufacturing taxes, air, whatever that may be, and often, sometimes maybe even county um, regulations, it, it, it kind of adds up, right? So it, it adds up and, and it, it affects our inputs and outputs. And as a commodity, the, the market kind of dictates our price right so it is challenging for us the more we adhere to these regulations in oregon it's challenging for us um maybe not across a company as maybe say we are southeast operations but for uh, for competition with other companies in other industries or similar industries it's challenging because then we it, it makes it harder for us to sell and produce products that are adherence to the, the commodity pricing of the market right so um, and that's where it's a little bit challenging for us. It, it just makes it harder to compete. Um, and then the less money we bring in, the less revenue goes to the state of Oregon, so. Well, thanks thanks very much for your answers to that question. Uh, I don't, 
I don't, I want, I want us to have uh, some uplifting moments in this panel. So I, I don't want it all to be a, a downer. Um, we've all uh, managed our businesses through uh, a global pandemic. You know, I can remember where, when it started um, reaching out to uh, uh, any government official who would listen to me, uh, you know, telling them we need to keep our, our plants open, um, that we were an essential business. And, you know, as that whole process sorted out, um, you know, ultimately it was determined we were, but, um, you know, that was a very chaotic time. Um, as we kind of managed through the pandemic, of course, the supply chain crunch hit. And uh, I'd like uh, all, all of our panelists to kind of talk about um, some successes you had over the last two years, because we had, we had a lot of heroics and, uh, you know, I can't begin to call them all out, but uh, certainly our sourcing team did an amazing job through this period where there were, you know, we, we have steel as our biggest input, um, but uh, we also have a lot of specialties that you have to put on a rail car and, um, you know, facilities were, uh, had er erratic schedules, you know, particularly at the start of the pandemic. And then we had the, the freight transportation crisis, which we have a front row seat to. Um, and our group managed to really help us get the inputs we needed and get our product out to our customers, um, despite some real headwinds. We also have, a, uh, you know, we're one of the largest builders in Europe for a smaller freight rail car market. And the, the war there uh, earlier this year uh, created, uh, you know, a complete shutdown of our supply chain as it began. And um, our team there also was very adroit in addressing that. So that's kind of our success story over the last uh, couple of years. One example, one success story over the last couple of years. What are yours? Uh, uh, we'll start with Alicia. Yeah, so um, I founded Willamette Technical Fabricators in 2020, about two years ago. Uh, so as a pandemic startup, a disadvantaged woman and minority-owned small business and a certified benefit company, I think just surviving the last two years is pretty great. Uh, we started with two people, now we're 42 and actively hiring. Uh, but what I'm most proud of is that in those two years of operations, we've had zero voluntary attrition. And that's among our engineers and our office staff and our welders and machinists in the shop. So our workforce is pretty diverse, especially for Portland, where 43% women and people of color. Our average employee doesn't have a college degree and they're making over $85,000 a year plus great benefits. But with as much turnover as I know we've all seen um, you know, through the great resignation or I like to call it the great renegotiation, I think that's the most powerful metric that we have to know that we're doing a good job. Great, thank you, Alicia and Marv. Thank you. Congratulations on your success, Alicia. That no voluntary turnover. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, two and a half years. Um, it seemed like it's been a long time, and we we've dealt with a lot of supply chain challenges. What's happened with our business is our demand has taken off, unlike anything we ever would have anticipated. While we've had a lot of challenges with our supply chain, and we we make complex products, so whether it's the raw materials, parts, injected molded uh, parts, um, uh, electronics that go into our products, they're, they're sophisticated. So we've got a very complex supply chain and there are suppliers um, that we work with, very loyal suppliers that haven't necessarily been willing to increase their capacity like we need them to. We're working with them and, and getting through that. But I think one of the things we're most proud of is all the people we've added to our team and um, just managing, bringing on 500 more people within our manufacturing business and supporting them through very difficult times. I mean, through the, the COVID guidelines, we had people in manufacturing uh, standing, working 10, 11 hours a day wearing masks. And uh, it's very, very difficult. And the way we supported our team through COVID handled that situation. I'm very proud of our team. And you know, we've had to come together and, and redesign products. Our engineering team has just done a phenomenal job. So across the board, our team's been very resilient. And um, we, we've, we've had a theme, United We Thrive, uh, that we've been using throughout the whole pandemic. And um, it's really, it's true with this team. Phenomenal people here at ADAC who I, I love greatly. So um, that's got us through this situation. Yeah, um, 
both Alicia and Marv, you know, we we work with the National Association of Manufacturers, and I have to say, you know, as an as an industry, I think manufacturers did as well by their people as any other industry during this pandemic. And um, you know, um, we were, you know, and as the rules were coming out again, there was a lot of one size fits all approaches, and you know, I can remember some of the social distancing arguments, and you know. It's like the PPE and ER people have to wear. It's like they're already masked. In fact, many of them are on a respirator welding uh, all day long, and they have to be socially distant for uh, safety purposes. So we were we were doing masking and social distancing before it was cool, and um, uh, you know. But again, it, it took some time occasionally with OSHA in some places to, and some states to explain. You know, our, our workers are probably safer at work uh, than they are anywhere else in the community, so. Yeah, uh, one other thing I might add, I forgot. Sure. Um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, our business went down about 70, 80%, and we wanted to retain all of our people. So um, some of our folks came up with the idea of making uh, shields for the medical, local medical community, which was a huge uh, help for that, that group. So I was really proud of the team that did that. Excellent, excellent. Con, what were what were some of Schnitzer's uh, highlights uh, of achievement during the last couple of years? Yeah, so we, I, you know, obviously through the pandemic and all that, we faced same challenges as everyone else, logistically um, and health and all that. But we actually had some pretty good years these last couple of years. We've had our safest year on record uh, and also the most profitable year on record for the last two years. Uh, we also expanded our, our footprint in the Southeast, uh, expanded to New Shredder down there. So we've had mergers and acquisitions, uh, profits, uh, safety, and all while I think, I think my, the, the proudest, I think, innovation we've, we've created was our, is our green steel, GRN, uh, green recyclable necessary. It's our first uh, net zero carbon finished steel product available to our customers. And that comes out of Cascade Steel in McMinnville. Um, and you know that that just kind of proves uh, one the leadership of the company uh, and how they can innovate and adjust and pivot in times of, of uh, necessity, but also I think it, it, sh it shows how stable uh, a foundation manufacturing the in as industry is um, overall. So um, lots of uh, lots of good to come out, and and, and our employees uh, have been safer and, and treated really well. Great, great. Thanks for thanks for that, um, all three of you. Um, you know, I'd like to, as we kind of come up near the top of the hour, I'd like to ask one final um, question of uh, each of you. And certainly here at Greenbrier, you know, we're viewing November eighth as probably the most important election, uh, at least in our, our corporation's forty-year lifetime. I mean, we we just feel like the stakes are really high for the state, and um, we are very are hopeful, you know, certainly the top of the ticket is getting a lot of attention and you can't even, uh, you know, quietly stream in the comfort of your home without uh, seeing all three candidates, uh, you know, intrude on on your solitude. But uh, uh, be that as it may, um, and, you know, the legislative race, I think OBI is doing a great job uh, making sure, um, you know, we're, uh, being a voice for manufacturers and for the broadest, broader business community and, and you know, some very close legislative races that are going on out there. My, my question is this one. Um, we are gonna have a new governor uh, in January and uh, I can say, what, what would your message be to her um, uh, as she takes office uh, in terms of, you know, one step you could take or, or you know, one one policy decision you can make that would be helpful to your business and maybe uh, helpful to the broader manufacturing community. And Alicia, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think the message I, I want to share is that, you know, we all want a clean and safe Oregon. We want a thriving and equitable economy. Manufacturers are not the enemy. Um, we are some of the best allies to help bring our very ambitious statewide decarbonization and equity goals into fruition. Great. Marv? I'd say get out and meet with the businesses and understand their needs. Very simple, but we don't see a lot of that. And I, I'd love for the, the new governor to do that. Excellent. And Khan? Uh, Marv stole my idea. Yeah, I think uh, not just the governor, but state agency leaders, um, state reps, get out there, meet the business in your districts, um, get to know them, educate yourself on what they do and how they uh, impact the community. Great, great. 
Well, hopefully the folks listening today will, will agree with me, but I mean, what a tremendous uh, group of companies we had represented here today and everybody's innovating, uh, everybody's growing. And that's just such uh, an important feature of our state's economy that I think often gets overlooked. So, you know, appreciation to OBI uh, for arranging this webinar today, for the roadshow that they've done, um, raising manufacturing on the radar of uh, our policymakers throughout the state. So with that, Scott, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, I know I know you have more to share with us. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jack. And what a just on behalf of OBI, thank you so much to the panelists and you, Jack, for doing this. That was a great discussion. Uh, I real quickly, I want to just address a couple of the questions that came in, and I'll just I'll be real quick about it. Uh, one of the questions had to do with comparative taxes and whatnot. I just want everybody to know when we're talking about taxes, OBI has been behind some significant studies in the last three years. We actually did a study and we're refreshing it right now, which shows that the effective business tax rate in Oregon has actually increased over 40 percent state wide since 2000 um, since 2019 and in the Portland metropolitan area an additional 23 percent so Portland now has the second highest marginal income tax rate in the nation and so that's one of the big challenges that we have on the tax side uh, another question had to do with workforce training and our and just kind of getting into the high schools and getting into the colleges uh, there's a lot to that we're working with the National Association of Manufacturers to bring some of those ideas but the, the question is well well asked and well and well founded. Um, one of the things we're doing as part of that pro growth innovation package is offering training, not offering, I mean, uh, pushing, if you will, or promoting worker training tax credits to give companies like ADEC and Schnitzer and, and Willamette Technical Fabs the ability to hire people that may not come out of school with great uh, technical background, but give them the resources to be able to train them. And then finally, there was a question about Future Ready Oregon. And, uh, you know, that's a brand new piece of policy. Uh, our good friends over at OBC are kind of leading the charge on how that will uh, translate into, uh, you know, how, how employers can be able to use that. So stay tuned on that one. I, I don't have a full answer on that one, but just stay tuned because it's, it's a new policy. All right. So we're winding up here just a couple of minutes. I want to just kind of announce what's going to happen next year because it's really exciting. So we will, the plan is uh, we will do a bus tour again next year. Uh, but it will be more. It won't be a month long uh, affair like it was in August of this year. That was just our get out of the get out of the gates and make the big splash for the first time ever. Next year, we we expect that the that the bus tour will be four or five days in length, and it will happen in conjunction with today, which is National Manufacturing Day, which is always the first Friday of October. So I guess that's probably October seventh next or eighth next year or whatever. However, that flies in the calendar. Um, so we're really excited about that. And another thing we're really excited about, and we will finish up with this. Part of Manufacturing Week next week and Manufacturing Day, or excuse me, next year and Manufacturing Day next year is that OBI is going to start offering uh, through the National Association of Manufacturers some outstanding manufacturing awards. And I just want to run through those real quick. I won't go into the, the detail because uh, there's more to come, but we will be um, taking nominations and going through the process to award five awards that we'll do for the first time next year. One is Excellence in Innovation. One is excellence in environmental sustainability. One is excellence in workforce development. One is excellence in community impact. And then finally, a manufacturing champion of the year award. So we're for all for Oregon. So those are all, all the first four will all be awarded to manufacturers or manufacturing supporters. The final one, the manufacturing champion, could be somebody within the industry. It could be it could be an elected leader outside the industry. So we'll we'll wait for the nominations and see how that goes. All right. Well, I want to say thank you again. To everybody for joining today, I want to say happy Manufacturing Day, October 7th. It's also my oldest daughter's birthday, so I couldn't forget it. Uh, and I also want to say um, a thank you to our sponsors. I mean, as we've mentioned throughout, just tremendous support. We could not do this. And I'm just I'm just being whimsical. We could not have done the bus tour. We could not have done the the um, uh, the, the manufacturing day uh, celebration today if it were not for the great contributors, sponsors and hosts. So with that, I bid you all a good day, a happy manufacturing day and have a tremendous weekend. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everybody.